Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have Ella Young, and she is an alcohol-free coach and balance hormone expert who helps heal people's bodies and mind and so forth, and, and she improves their lives tremendously. She's going to go in that because she's, she's just a, a wonderful individual. She's actually on our podcast community. She has her own podcast, and she talks about um, just changing your life and learning how to become alcohol free, learn how to balance your hormones, learn how to heal. And these are things that, you know, for every woman, especially it's, it's something that's most needed in our society because we all go through these fades in our lives and, and depending on the age group you're in. And, you know, a lot of people just don't know how and what to do. A lot of times these things creep up on us and we just don't know what the answer is and how to go about it it. And Ellie has gone through a lot of stuff in her life. She's learned what works and doesn't work. She's created great ways of healing yourself. And she's here today to show you how. So I'm very excited. You know, you're here today to talk about building a brilliant life beyond alcohol. And I love it. I love the, the whole idea because, you know, a lot of times when we get older, you know, it's like, okay, what's left? The kids are grown up. Okay. Uh, let's go out to dinner. Let's grab a drink. You know, let's do this. And, and, it, and it gets old. And then, you know, and it also leads could lead to other things too. And we don't want to use alcohol also as a coping mechanism to cope with life and some of the obstacles that we have in life as well. So I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. And so take it away. Tell everybody a little about yourself, what you do and, and how to build a brilliant life beyond alcohol. Yeah. Thank you, Stacy. As always, it's great to be back. This is part three of our series and for those of you following along, or if you are not following along and you're new, um, my name is Ellie Young. I'm an alcohol-free life coach and hormone balancing expert. And so I help women cut alcohol and balance their hormones and then heal. So this kind of follows my own journey. Um, I gave up alcohol just before my 40th birthday. I did not want to wake up in the next decade of my life with another hangover. Um, I was a gray area drinker and, you know, my entire world revolved, my entire social world revolved around alcohol. And nobody was telling me it was bad or wrong. I just knew deep down that I didn't want to feel like that anymore. And once I finally overcame alcohol, um, I started getting into hormone balancing because my body was changing everything about what, what used to work was no longer working. And so um, that trajectory kind of took me into this next level healing journey that really changed my life. Um, so the first episode that we did together, I really got into the first step in the framework that I help my clients to, to kind of break up with booze, if you will. And that is really going through um, the subconscious beliefs that keep us attached to alcohol, that keep us believing it has some sort of perceived benefit. And mm -hmm. then our next episode, we got into the tangible physical habit. And that's where we started hacking the cue, the craving and the response and reward loop. And mm -hmm. that way, you know, we've done the mindset work and now then they do the physical habit. This episode is really about, okay, you've got the foundation, you've got the framework, you understand the science, you understand how to hack the physical habit. How do we actually apply it into our lives? How do we move forward with these kind of ideals now that we are like, okay, I know I want this life, but how do I actually apply it and keep it up? Like, how do I keep consistency and not kind of fall in and out of this new behavior change? Right. And I, I think it's so important because, you know, when we get, you know, it's very easy, especially when you're hanging out with friends, even if you have yet like young, young kids and, you know, you know, parents will get together and the kids will play or, you know, or you'll have get togethers with parents and, you know, people are, you know, drinking and, you know, and, and eating and, and it's like, you know, you get into these bad habits where you feel like, okay, everyone's drinking, I'm going to have a drink too. And, and, you know, or you feel like sometimes like we've talked about this, you know, can I actually be fun if I'm not like, you know, if I don't have a drink, you know, I won't really be so loose and, you know, people might not like who I am, you know, you know, the regular me, because I'm not acting silly or saying silly things and, you know, maybe cracking jokes, you know, a certain way that I normally wouldn't if I, you know, you know, didn't have the alcohol in me. 
And, um, and then sometimes it can be habit forming and it can be, you know, you get to a point where, you know, you, you start going through tough times in life and you know that alcohol kind of takes the edge off of you. So then you immediately want to get a drink because it makes you feel better, but then it no longer is just for entertainment. Now you've gotten to a point where it could be for, you know, more so for coping mechanisms, you know, just to cope with life in general. And then, you know, a lot of people increase the amount of alcohol they drink, and then it starts to get into a, a really big problem. And then, as you know, you start to gain weight. It starts to change the chemistry of your body. And then it can also interfere big time with your hormones and stuff like that. So, you know, it's uh, it's not a good thing. And, and, and actually learn how to live life dry is actually a really good thing. And, you know, it's just learn how to get there. Yeah, it's and and this is the slippery slope that everybody is on when they um they start drinking and it seems so benign, we're so conditioned. Um it seems so safe and you know we everyone believes that there's a safe way. You know, even the labels on alcohol bottles says enjoy responsibly. They're putting the onus on the person that you should be able to enjoy this substance responsibly. And if not, if it's interfering with your life, then there's probably something wrong with you. It's not the substance. They're taking all of the blame off of this toxic substance. And mm -hmm. so when I get into my work with people, it it really is examining those exact scenarios you just described. Like, but what do you mean I, I can't have a drink when I'm out with my friends and, you know, or I'm at a barbecue and like there's there's literally no area in life where alcohol hasn't found its way into. And so yeah. that's why it's such a monumental shift that has to take place to kind of disengage with this habit that has been so conditioned into us. And so that's why it really is a three-part system that we go through because we start to, you know, we work on that subconscious mind and we start to ask ourselves like, do we really need alcohol to enjoy ourselves, to relax, to be funny? And what we find is like, no, these aren't true statements. These are not scientifically true. Um, it, it temporarily numbs your brain. It takes your brain offline. I mean, we got into the science on the first two episodes. And, but, and so then we, 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 we lay a new foundation subconsciously of like what the truth is actually about alcohol. And right. that it takes, it takes time to like marinate in there and to start to change your neurochemistry, to start to change the neural pathways because your brain loves efficiency. It has built this infrastructure of drinking over the last 20, 30 years. And yeah. to form a new pathway, it's got a lot of friction. It's it's a new rickety little pathway and it takes a lot of, a lot more energy and effort on your part. And that's why we get into that kind of hacking the cue, the craving response and reward, like recognizing the environments that trigger us. How do we, re how do, can we eliminate those as much as possible? How can we make that craving seem unattractive? Like reminding yourself of what the chemistry of alcohol does to your brain. And then mm -hmm. we, we try to replace the reward. You really can't hack a habit unless you can replace the reward that your brain is after. Your brain is after that dopamine boost. And yeah. so that's kind of what this next phase of life is, is like, how do we build a life that's like equally rewarding, that's equally satisfying, something that we can crave other than craving this alcohol. And it really is one, it comes from a new mindset of, of believing that this new life is really possible for you. And if, if my clients can't imagine it, if they can't picture themselves living alcohol free, and it's really hard to do, I definitely couldn't do it because my life was just so intertwined with alcohol. And so it really is crafting this vision of yourself, living alcohol free, waking up early, living like this person that ideally, like, who do you want to be? What kind of life? What does that person feel like every day? They're waking yeah. up with energy. They don't have hangovers. They're, they're excited about the work they're doing. They have passions. They have interests. It's not this groundhog day of like the highlight of my week is to, is to drink, you know? Um, and so that's this next step. And a lot of people get stuck here. So what I call this, this step is kind of interesting because I'll take you through the, the like cycle of change. So in the beginning, it's called unconscious incompetence, meaning you are unaware that you need to change and you actually can't change. You're not physically capable of changing unconscious incompetence. 
The next stage, this is after usually they've learned this subconscious work and they're like, oh my gosh, yes, alcohol is doing me a huge disservice. I really want to change. That is called conscious incompetence. So they're aware that they want to change, yeah. but they, they still can't change. And they're like, oh, this is like the most uncomfortable place to be because it's really your subconscious is battling your conscious. It's like, I want to stop drinking, but my subconscious is like sabotaging me. And the next step, when they start to kind of hack these habits and they start to kind of apply it in their life and they're getting a little success, but they're recognizing it's still really awkward. There's still a lot of friction in my life. This is like, you know, a month into it, two months into it. I call this conscious competence. Like you're doing it, but you're aware that you're doing it. And so you're like, it's a lot of work mentally still. You're like, yes. oh, this is like, it's, it's a huge amount of effort. I have to really be intentional. I have to really prepare. And then when you finally get to the stage where you're like, this has become second nature for me, it's called unconscious competence. You're not, you don't even have to think about it. You're able yeah. to do it. And so my, my journey is to get people from those next stages and where people really, really, truly get stuck is after they've learned the science and after they've learned how to hack the habit, they are still telling themselves a story that they're not this person. Yeah. That they can't be this person. I can't be someone who wakes up at 5 a.m. and goes to a 6 a.m. yoga class. Like I have all these stories and all these reasons I'm telling myself why that's not going to work. And yeah. what, what I find is that for most people, these stories aren't your own stories. These are, again, subconscious programming that like you're a mom. You have to be home for your kids in the morning. You can't go to a yoga class, you right. know, like. Who are you to put yourself first? Like yeah. your job as a mom is to self-sacrifice and to put everyone else's needs above your own. And so a lot of the resistance people feel in this next stage of like getting to this ideal self that they want to be is yeah. are these subconscious stories that are like creating all this resistance and saying like, it's a lot of doubt. It's a lot of procrastination. It's a lot of negative self-talk. And yeah. Once what I get my clients to work on at this point is to be like, when you're visualizing this incredible future life for yourself, what is the loudest voice telling you you can't do it or can't have it? And when you start to examine it, you go, whose voice is that? I, that's not me. I didn't put that story there. I didn't choose yeah. that. And so you go, is it, can I rewrite that? Can I tell myself something co totally new here? Like I am someone who can wake up early, who wants to see the sunrise, who wants to spend the morning journaling and staying off my phone and drinking my lemon water and drinking my tea. And that might sound really annoying to people. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. what kind of morning is that? Like, who are you? I wake up with a headache every day and a panic attack. Like, that was me. Like, I used to wake up every day in, in like this mental space of like, you have to fix what you did to yourself last night. And if you can't fix it, if you can't make yourself feel better with exercise, with overachieving, with supplements, with caffeine, then you have to kind of like admit that you might have a problem with alcohol. This thing that everybody else is doing in this social world. But if it's interfering with your life, then you actually have to be like, oh, something's wrong with me. But I, you know, I was able to cover it up for so long. And I know so many women are like this because we aren't, taught that we're just taught that you should be able to drink wine and socialize and go out with your friends and have you know be a mom and do it all but you can't be hung over and you can't let it interfere with your life and that's like a big lie the fact that they think that there's like a way to thread the needle with this toxic substance and the reality is you cannot it's a toxic it's a toxic substance and the more you can get to a place in your life where you're like it doesn't align with who I want to be. It doesn't align with the life I want to live. And I'm so after this future self that I'm going to let the hope of that pull me forward. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's a sticky place to be for a lot of people because so much comes up at this phase of, at this phase of the work, but it's exactly the pace and the place you need to be in order to make monumental changes in your life. Oh, for sure. You know, I, I think it's so important. And you mentioned also that there are certain types of tactics and, and certain things that you could do and, you know, to be able to 
begin, you know, because lots of times, like we mentioned, like people don't know where to begin and they don't know what type of tools and strategies and tactics they can apply to their life to make this transition an easy transition, you know, because nothing's really easy. I shouldn't say easy, but, you know, it's, you know, people don't know how to begin, you know, they don't, you know, I think it starts with little tweaks and then you keep working your way up the ladder, but you know, people don't really know how to begin and they, they don't know what works and what doesn't work. And from your own experience, what tactics and what things do you feel really play a huge impact, a positive impact on people's lives when they're in this process of change or they want to be in this process of change? Yeah. Well, that's the entire basis of the the first course I created, the brave course. It really is that foundational work of changing your subconscious beliefs, breaking them down so that you no longer believe alcohol to be a reward, um, that it's the answer that you need it because that those subconscious things are controlling your behavior. It's what's creating the craving. And, And so one of the biggest steps or tactics that I offer people in this kind of phase when they're like, okay, I've learned, I really don't want this stuff in my life but I'm still in this waffle area where I'm like, I'm going to try not to drink this weekend, but I like haven't fully closed the door on that decision. So I call this tactic decision-making fatigue. So our brains are making thousands, millions of decisions all day long, right? It's, it wants efficiency. It doesn't want to have to overthink things that are recognizable situations. So if you are asking it after thousands of decisions that it's made all day to weigh, Hey, am I going to drink or not? It's going to default to the most familiar, easy pathway. And so we want to let our brain get to that point where it's like fatigued. And then we're like, will I drink? Will I not drink? Cause it's, you're going to default. So we set ourselves up from the moment you wake up, we close the door on that decision. And I'm not saying you have to say, I'll never drink again, or I won't drink for 30 days straight. We're just saying, I'm not going to drink tonight. And what you do then is you make that big decision. And so now the rest of your day is in support of that one big decision. So you think to yourself, okay, I know when I'm, when I'm tired, when I'm fatigued, when I'm cranky, when I'm hungry, when I'm annoyed, when I'm lonely, Um, what is the acronym? It's called HALT. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. All of those are moments when I might crave a drink. So Mm -hmm. what can I do today to set myself up so that I don't get into a place where I'm going to be craving alcohol? And it's easier said than done, but you start first thing in the morning. And that's why I like to really start my clients off with like a daily morning ritual. And it can be really, really simple in the beginning. You can have lemon water, you can stay off your phone and you can do five, 10 minutes of journaling. And what you're communicating with that, this is really intentional, is I am taking care of you today. You are sending messages to your nervous system. Hey, I recognize that today might be hard. Today might be stressful. I'm going to start the day off like you're my newborn baby and I'm going to take the best care of you. And it really does send signals to yourself that like, I don't need to like jack myself up with caffeine. I don't need to deny myself these feelings. I'm going to continue to take care of myself all day long. Um, Because at the end of the day, alcohol is a comfort seeking ritual. Yes. And we have to learn how to comfort ourselves in other ways. And that starts again, first thing in the morning. And so That kind of leads me into like one of my next tactics is called um, staying above the 50% line. Mm -hmm. So we've got decision-making fatigue. We understand that the brain is going to be super tired. We want to firmly close the door on the decision. I'm not drinking tonight. Well, how do I set myself up for that? So I don't crave, so I don't get stuck. And staying above the 50% line, a lot of people have heard this one, but it's basically like, I recognize when I'm in that halt zone, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, I make bad choices. You know, I overeat, I drink, I snap, I want to lay and zone out and scroll on social media or binge watch TV. Um, And what we have to recognize is that anytime you find yourself in that zone, we should stop what we're doing and take 10 minutes, if you can, 
to try and get yourself above that 50% line. Right. And because any decision you're making when you're below your 50% line, any work you're doing, any conversation you're trying to have is not going to go well. And you might have to come back and redo everything you did in that time anyway. So you might think like, oh, I don't have time. I don't have time to take a 10 minute walk right now. But the th you have to recognize that like whatever you're doing now, it's not going to go great. And you're probably going to have to come back and fix it. So get up, get outside, get some fresh air, do some jumping jacks, get a snack, get some water, get some electrolytes. And we do whatever we can to put ourselves back above that 50% line where we are less vulnerable to mm -hmm. craving. We are less vulnerable to these moments where we might feel the need to self-medicate. Right. And so those, uh, that's, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that's excellent. That's an excellent idea, you know, to uh, incorporate. Yeah. Yeah. So those are, those are two tactics that come in really handy. And so, um, the, the decision-making fatigue one is so interesting because so many of my clients, like I just had one, um, she was turning 50 and she really didn't want to drink on her 50th birthday. She's been kind of in and out of sobriety. She's had long stretches and then she would kind of slip up again and then long stretches and her 50th birthday came up and she's like, I really don't want to drink on my 50th birthday. I want to be able to do um, this thing, but she hadn't closed the door. She's like, I want to, but she hadn't made a firm decision. And so she did end up drinking on her 50th birthday. She did it in a way that she was okay with, you know, she was like, I didn't overdo it. I only had a little, I felt in control. So the way she felt about it at the end, she felt good about. And that's the thing. I don't necessarily advocate for everybody to be just like me. Like you have to be a hundred percent cold Turkey, all or nothing sort of thing. It's really, how do you feel in your relationship to alcohol? If you're right. okay with this once in a while, um, you know, people say special occasion, and I would argue that you don't need alcohol, or why do we believe alcohol is part of a special occasion? Um, yes. when, when in reality, it's like wrecking your gut health, giving you a hangover, making you feel like shit. It's like, is that how I want to celebrate my special occasion? But right. it's so ingrained in us. You know, she's like, I'm turning 50. But what was so interesting to me, too, about this situation is that she told like a couple of people that she didn't want to drink. But her husband, who was aware that she was um, trying to do this, gifted her a very high end bottle of tequila for her birthday that she ended up drinking. And that was like, oh, I ended up drinking because my husband gifted me this fancy bottle of tequila. And I was like, wait a minute, like, yeah. that, like, wasn't he on board with this thing? I even gifted her a whole bunch of non-alcoholic beverages that she could like have in her glass and make pretty and do all these things. And, um, and, and again, I don't want to like shame her or shame her husband or anything like that. But I'm like, these are the kinds of things that we are up against. Yeah. It is even when people are aware of what you're trying to do and people yeah. are well-intentioned. I mean, when I turned 40, I can't, I was already alcohol free. I was only like six weeks and I can't tell you the amount of alcohol I got for my 40th birthday. And again, I hadn't really gone public with it. So I yeah. don't, fault, I don't fault anybody, but just the ubiquitousness of alcohol when you're trying to remove it from your life, it's, you are up against a huge, it's a huge hurdle. And yes. yeah, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be underestimated um, how difficult this is. And that's why um, all of my coaching comes from this like incredibly compassionate and curious place. There is no shame, there is no judgment, and there is no labels because none of that stuff works, right? What works is getting curious about your brain, getting curious about the world we live in and and the mindset that is going to either help us get to this new future self we want, or it's going to keep us stuck. Right. And, and, and when it's, when it's very hard some, sometimes for people to change their mindset, like, are there, are there things, you know, that people can do to start changing the way they think? Cause even though people I, I notice from, from my own clients, they change their mindset, but it's very easy to fall back into your old mindset. Mm -hmm. 
It's like, yeah. you know, it's like a battle. You you do it, you're good for a little bit, and then you start to swing back into some of the old ways of thinking. And you know you're not, you shouldn't be having that type of mindset, but you fall, you kind of see yourself slide into it, I guess, because maybe it's habit forming. You've done it for so long, you know. Are there ways that you work with clients that, you know, that that have trouble, you know, staying straight with a, with a strong mindset? Are there things that people could do? Because I know so many people struggle with that productive mindset, you know, and not falling backwards. Yeah, I think there's kind of that new shiny object syndrome. Like when you're first starting a new program, there's a lot of motivation. There's a lot of interest. And then yeah. that it kind of can like peter out. Um, and and we default again to the old familiar structure in our brain that is just quite literally it's like it's like the autobahn it's like a well grooved pathway that is like super familiar and it just requires so much less work for the brain and this yeah. new mindset again it's requiring energy it requires attention and work and so one of the best ways I have found to keep people super engaged with the challenge yeah. is you actually gamify it and you say you because the further people get out in their like habits like okay you've now gone a week alcohol free now you've gone two weeks three weeks four weeks yeah I have a lot of people right around the six week mark who are like I got this and then something will happen and they slip up and they drink and they're like oh, what happened you know I didn't want to drink I don't know how that happened and I'm like well sometimes the the pain of the hangover can motivate us so far or the pain of whatever bad habit you're trying right. to overcome and the memory of it is so like haunting you. You're like, I don't ever want to do that again. I don't ever want to feel that way again. But the further out you get from it, you start to go, was it really that bad? It wasn't that bad. Right. So like it's the it's the carrot and the stick. The stick stops feeling so scary. And so that's when we have to up the ante with the carrot. We have to dangle something so awesome in front of ourselves reward ourselves and I actually tell my friends like every or my clients every week that you do it like you're saving a lot of money on wine right now so why don't you put that hundred bucks towards like some a gift for yourself right, right. And every week you get to like up the ante like what are you going to get yourself this week what are you going to do if you make it a hundred days alcohol free right so you can gamify it that way and then another tactic that I love and it's called it's called gains thinking so a mm -hmm. lot of people get caught up in feeling like they have so far to go. They're like, oh, I'm only two weeks into this. Like, how will I ever do a full month? Right. Um, they have to, you have to shift their thinking to look backwards and to look at how far they come. Right. And what we do is we, I ask them like right before bedtime, I say, I want you to write down three things you did today. And sometimes they're great and huge, like huge accomplishments. Like if you didn't drink, definitely write that one down. And there can be more than three as well. But sometimes it's like, I did the laundry today, you know, <laughs> I cooked dinner, you know, I managed to not yell at my kids, whatever it is. Sometimes those days are just like, but let's still celebrate those little wins. Yeah. And that trains your brain to like celebrate yourself and to get into the energy of like, yeah. I'm, I am making progress. Right. Because when we're so focused on this huge gap and how far we have to go, it can be like demotivating. You're like, oh, you know, it feels it feels like deprivation. It's it's energetically like depleting. Yes. And so instead we turn around and we measure how far we've come. And then we also set three small goals for the very mm -hmm. next day. And you don't want to have more than three. You just want to have three because there's that saying. It's like if you have more than three priorities, you have no priorities. So we just, mm -hmm. let's pick three things and always initially for my clients, it's like, I will not drink today. Right. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to, um, you know, and I'm going to journal for 10 minutes, you know, write down these things that again, when you are anticipating and writing it down, I'm going to do these three things. Your brain starts to work on it, especially mm -hmm. at night while you sleep. It goes, Oh, these are the three things I want to do tomorrow. So your brain starts rehearsing it. What do I need to do in order to get that done? Well, I probably I'm going to have to put my shoes by the door. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing for the kids so that I can get out the door at this time. And the more you've rehearsed this and the more you've kind of like planned it out in your brain, it's easier when the moment strikes, there's less friction. And it goes back again to that, just those neural pathways. We're trying to make it as like 
buttery smooth as possible to do the new thing. I love it. I love it. And I like that you do like three small goals and it's not like, you know, anything overwhelming and it's just like some easy peasy type things, you know, mm -hmm. journal, go for a walk, you know, like, and, and it's, and it's, it's things like that have a really big impact, you know, on your, mm -hmm. on the way you think, on your mindset, on your clarity, you know, it, all you have to do is devote a little me time, I think, to just doing small things that bring enjoyment to your life. And then also remind you of how lucky you are. Because I think sometimes we lose gratitude and we we forget how lucky we are and what we actually have. And sometimes right. if we remind ourselves of these little things, we really start to look at life and try to be the best we can be because we realize you know, we, we take life a little bit more seriously. But when you think about how lucky we are, the people in our lives that love us and, you know, you don't want to let them down. And you, so you want to be good for, and you want to do something good for yourself so you can be good for them. And, you yeah. know, kind of like bounces off each other in a sense, I think. Yeah. And that's another element to my coaching that I want to stress that it's always about progress over perfection. I, I feel like people get so stuck in this all or nothing mentality, right? Where if I didn't do it hundred percent perfectly, then I failed. And yeah. it's, it's really not that. And they also believe that like, I will be happy when I get here. And yeah. it really isn't that it's about who you're becoming along the way. And right. alcohol has hindered us in so many areas of our life. Um, you know, there's the, um, six, I think it's the six components of, um, core human needs, right? And it's like, I have a need for connection. I have a need for um, variety in my life. I have a need for security in my life. And I think I, the other one's love. And then there's the needs of the spirit, which are growth and contribution. And what we find is like, we were giving alcohol all of those jobs, right? I'm lonely. I'm going to drink alcohol. I want to feel connected to people. I want to feel like I'm part of the in-group. I'm going to drink alcohol. Oh, status was one of them. I think I missed love and connection. One of the, the, one of the same status. Well, I'm going to join high expensive wine clubs. I'm going to go wine tasting, right? Spending money on alcohol makes me feel like I've made it in some sense of the world. Um, yeah. And then security, right? A lot of people drink to numb their fears, to numb their anxieties. And so when we start to remove this from our life, we start to go, holy shit, I have all these needs that I wasn't meeting. And like, yeah. how do I actually build a life now where I'm taking care of these. And that's yeah. when your world gets so much bigger. But again, it's, you know, it can feel overwhelming at first when you remove this huge coping mechanism. And then you say, and now you got to do all these things for your health and all these things for your wellness. And you got to take care of your family and you got to like manage your mental health. And oh, by the way, here comes perimenopause. <laughs> and like, you better, you better figure your shit out, you know? Um, yeah. so it can just feel so overwhelming. And so that is literally the intersection that I recognize my clients are in. It's like, Hey, our worlds are really, really tough. We've been giving alcohol a ton of jobs and we're going to kick alcohol to the curb. We're going to start really taking care of ourselves. And we're going to do it from a place of just like so much compassion and so yeah. much self-love that it's, it's like a completely new relationship with self because, we're no longer just punishing ourselves with a toxin and then shame, trying to be something, some fulfill someone else's story, someone right. else's expectation of ourselves. And so we get to like rewrite it all. And yeah. honestly, it's it's impossible to do this with alcohol still in your life because it clouds us. It clouds yeah. our judgment. It fills us with anxiety and adrenaline and shame. It to completely wrecks your hormonal health. And yeah. when we have all of those things working against us, we don't have a shot. Like we don't have a shot at good wellness. We're just clinging on, like barely holding on. Right. It's so true. It's so true. And alcohol really does do a lot to your body and, and it really messes up the hormones completely. People don't realize how, how badly alcohol can actually harm your hormones. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, we're going to get into that. So if people are listening, the next episode, and I'll give a little teaser right now, is where my journey took me is into hormone balancing and, and, a, and a concept called cycle syncing. So this is very trendy right now. A lot of people have heard about it, 
But again, it's stemming from it's it is a diet, but it's not the the end goal is not to be skinny. We have spent decades trying to do that, right? And that is a losing battle, especially in in perimenopause and menopause. I'm not saying you cannot lose weight, and and that is you will lose weight when you do this correctly, but that's not the end goal. The end goal is to build foundational health by balancing your hormones because your hormones are literally at the top of like your wellness period pyramid. They control everything else. They control your metabolism. They control your sleep. They control your mental health. They control your bone health, your heart health, gut health. It goes on and on and on and on. So we are literally going all the way back to the source and we're saying, how do I, how do I work on these? And people think it's your estrogen, your progesterone. We go one step higher. We work on our cortisol and our insulin first. And that is why the alcohol piece has to come first because alcohol raises your cortisol. It messes with your insulin sensitivity and it makes it near impossible for you to balance those two, which are, which are responsible for the, the, the levels of your sex hormones, which are then are going to affect, you know, your PMS, your cycle, your fertility, your mental health. And so it, we we keep moving all the way up the chain to get to the root cause of so mm -hmm. much of our suffering. And yeah. in this day and age, there needs to be a public service announcement to women that like, hello, alcohol, that glass of wine you're having that you think is helping you take a load off at the end of the day. It is backfiring in the biggest way. And I really want to inspire and motivate women to like find a new way. And yeah. when they stay like, you know, the first reaction, if you are having a reaction right now, listeners and your body like, whoa, no way I cannot there's no way I could give up my glass of wine. Question that. Like what belief is coming up the most? What is the loudest voice you're telling yourself? Like I yeah. need it to relax. Okay. Now we have a starting point. Let's work on that. Let's work on that subconsciously. Like why do you believe alcohol is, is going to help you relax? Especially when I tell you it's actually jacking up your cortisol, jacking up your adrenaline, all the yeah. stress hormones in your body. Yeah, exactly. And and that's so true. It's so true. And so many women suffer from from hormone, you know, problems with their hormones. And you know, and I I feel like you see a lot of women that are going through their their changes actually increase the level of alcohol because they there right. are so many different issues that they'd never had before. And a lot of them use alcohol just to make them feel better because their moods are changing. They're feeling fatigued. They're gaining weight. They're having hot flashes. Right. All these things are happening. And, you know, some women, you know, just you go towards the alcohol just to make them feel a little bit better for, you know, a very short period of time. And then it's actually making things a lot worse. Yeah, that's the conundrum. If we've used it as a coping mechanism and it's been specifically marketed to women as a way to like feel better and bond and like you deserve it. This is how, you know, mommy, mom's night out, you know, it's, it's, it's actually just like a crime against women. It's, it's also when you, when you correlate just how much um, cancer is caused from, from alcohol, the rate, the risk of cancer goes way up. And again, that's related to our hormones because when your liver is prioritizing detoxing alcohol, it can't detox excess estrogen in your system. And the excess estrogen comes from drinking. It also comes from our toxic diets, our stressful lives. And so our liver is designed to handle some of this toxicity, right? It's like, okay, we're gonna work on that. But if you are drinking, the liver can't detoxify you. And so all that other, all those other toxins that are coming in are just sitting in your bloodstream. And what happens is it gets broken down into a metabolite that promotes cell growth. It's like eight out of 10 breast cancers are hormone receptor positive, meaning they need estrogen to grow. Yes. So that's how it happens is liver can't detox, estrogen starts to go up, it breaks down into this metabolite that is going to start cell proliferation. Yeah. And part of the cycle syncing method that I teach is how to detox excess estrogen out of our bodies. 
And that is through, it's all natural. It's, I mean, eventually as women get into menopause, I highly recommend like hormone replacement therapy, but in this kind of perimenopause window, it really is doing this holistically, doing this naturally, using food as medicine, using lifestyle and exercise as medicine. And you can literally start feeling better within 30 days. You can really go from like crazy gnarly periods to like symptom-free periods in, in, in a month. Yeah. Um, and I teach that's my, that's my balance challenge. So I have the brave course to help people start kickstarting their break from alcohol. And then the next course is the balance challenge. And it really is 30 days of cycle syncing, creating a ton of awareness about your cycle and your hormonal needs. Cause a lot of women are like in the complete dark about like what's happening during my cycle. They might vaguely know about ovulation if they've had a baby and they're like, okay, I remember that window. But the rest of it is like, oh my God, my period, you know, they might feel crazy for a couple of days and then their period surprises them. They're like, oh, that makes sense. That's, yeah. you know, that's why I felt felt like that. And I yelled at everybody. Um, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's really this next step. And again, it really just ties into this whole alcohol-free lifestyle. It's like, it's very punk rock to yeah. give up alcohol and to like be counterculture in that way. It's also yeah. very punk rock to be like, embrace your hormones don't view, don't view them as a burden. Right. Don't view them as something that weight makes women crazy. Like we yeah. are endowed with this gift, this incredible cycle that allows yeah. us to create life. And if you've been given a pill because you had bad periods, so many women are stuck in that boat and they're detoxing off, off of, um, you know, birth, birth control, um, yeah. or you've just been suffering and you've been taught to accept it. I want yeah. you to know, there is a complete way to eat, exercise, and and craft a lifestyle that is going to like lean into your hormones, see it as strengths, and you are going to start feeling so much better. Yes, definitely, hundred percent. Now, if you had to take today's conversation and you wanted to summarize it, what are some important factors you'd like to really emphasize to the listeners today? If you were sober, curious you were in perimenopause and you were kind of stuck in this place where you're like, I know I want to give up alcohol. I know I want to start taking better care of my body and understanding my hormone health, but I'm, I'm not there yet. And I keep making excuses about like, I can't because it's summer and I don't have time. Or, um, I have, I have to put all these other priorities first. I want you to start working on those subconscious stories. And I want you to start visualizing this future self that you want to be. And the right. resistance that comes up, whatever voice is telling you, you can't do that. I want you to rewrite that and be like, I can do this. And, and one of the best places to, to start feeling this way, if you don't, if you can't do that yourself, if you feel like it, it's too big of a stretch to help me feel that way, get in community, get in a course, hire a coach, enroll some friends to do it with you. Um, because you don't have to do it alone and you really need to craft your environment to support you. If you are staying uh, staying in the same environments, nothing's going to change, right? You have to be intentional about changing your your mindset and then yes. changing the environments around you. And um it's completely possible. I know because I've I've walked it. I've been there and um I can't tell you how many of my clients now um are on the other side and it's incredible to see the lives that they are crafting now, now that alcohol is no longer in the picture. I love that. I love that. Now you have the two programs, like, um, are there additional services that you provide? Yeah. So, um, one-on-one -on -one coaching. So after the brave course, and then if you've done the balance challenge, we can additionally go into one-on-one -on -one coaching to go deeper. Cause like I said, a lot of this stuff is just the foundational information. You're like, okay, I know how to quit alcohol now and I know how to balance my hormones. How do I really apply it in my life? And that's that mindset work and having somebody to talk to, a one-on-one -on -one coach who can say like, who can really poke holes in the stories you're telling yourself and to like really get to the bottom, to this root story. Because people, it's it's like um, it's like building a business. Like I can give you all these tools to build your business, but if you don't believe you can do it, you're not going to get there. And so right. I can give you all the tools, but if the belief isn't there, if you're yeah. still telling your story, this isn't going to work for me. 
Like, how do I do that? I'm not somebody who can do that kind of stuff. Like we have to, we have to clear that runway before, before all of this work could come and start like growing inside you. I love it. I love it. Now, where can people find you if they want to go and visit your website or if they want to visit you on the social network, where can they go to find you? Yeah. Um, so my website is findmyselffree.com and I, my Instagram is the same. It's findmyselffree. And then additionally, I have a podcast and it's also findmyselffree. Um, so I encourage people to start with my podcast because I really take people like on a journey of getting alcohol free and you can really get to know me and hear my story. And then please get inside my community, join one of my programs um, it's information that you can't unlearn. Yes. The second you hear it, you're going to be like, wow, I've never thought about it that way. And it, if it doesn't work right away from you, it's going to sit and it's going to marinate in your subconscious. And again, when you start crafting that belief that you can actually change doors yeah. are going to start opening in your awareness that you didn't even know were closed and change is imminent, positive change. I love it. I love it. This has been amazing. You know, I think it's so important that people understand that it you don't need alcohol to live life, you know, to live a fulfilling life and that it doesn't have to be difficult, you know, you know, with, with support and step-by-step -step instruction and guidance and different tools and tactics, it could be, it could, you know, it, it'll, it's not going to be like easy peasy, but it could be done. And as long as you have, you know, a good mindset and you have a coach that's going to be walking you through it anything is possible. And just like you said, we're not looking for perfection, which is a key note. People, sometimes they get really hard on themselves when they, if they screw up or they're not exactly where they thought they should be or want to be, it's okay. You know, mm -hmm. I, I say, let's reward ourselves for just making the effort, you know, and just, you know, if you have a goal, you know, just like you said, write those, those three goals down, you know, put, set some goals, you know, and just, you know, just work towards that one big common goal and start little and eventually we'll get there. But yeah, I think what you're doing is great. I think, you know, we don't need alcohol to live life fulfillingly. And, I, and you know, as women, as we're getting older, alcohol has been playing a, a big role. And it's not, you know, it's the, it's the red guy with a pitchfork and, you know, it does, he does do a lot of damage, you know, because everyone I know that, you know, has used alcohol, it's affected them in lots of ways. And including a lot of people I knew, they, they started to age quicker when they started mm -hmm. to drink. So yeah. it, it affects you in all areas of your life, your hormones, your anti-aging, your skin care, your body, your liver, everything, you know, so it's, it's something you really want to think about, you know, if you want to live a healthy, happy and productive life, you know, what you're teaching is, is something that people really should seriously consider. So I give you kudos for, for doing this and, and for helping so many women. Thank you. And I want to say, yeah, just like keep your eyes on the prize, like look ahead, look at that beautiful life you're after instead of focusing on like, oh, what's wrong with me? And what do I have to give up? And I'm going to feel deprived. It's turning your eyes forward and being like, I'm going to feel amazing. I'm going to reverse age. That's something we'll get into in a future episode is all of the healing that takes place when you start balancing your hormones, the rejuvenation that comes from biohacking. You can literally reverse cellular damage and mm -hmm. you will take years off your face, your body, your sleep. It is, it is like the fountain of youth, truly. I love it. I'll be, I'll be making sure I have my ears really listening <laughs> well. Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been great, Ellie. Like always, I love having you come on the show. I love, you know, that you do this podcast with us. And thank you so much today for all this great information. It's been a, a wonderful podcast. And I really appreciate all the information you provided our listeners today. Thank you, Stacey. It's as always, it's an honor. And I look forward to our next episode where I'll get into the hormone stuff. I love it. I'm, I can't wait. This has been great. You have a great day. Thank you, you too.